Five years ago, they adopted a man they'd never met, who writes to them from a prison cell in Israel. My dearest Nick and Mary, I'm very glad to hear from you so soon. About the next parole hearing, I don't know what will happen. We've passed a long time in a very bad, cruel condition. We will see what the U.S. is going to do with Iraq, if they'll go to war. The man they adopted is Mordecai Venunu, jailed as a traitor. He spent 11 years in solitary confinement. He was buried alive. He was shut up in a six by nine foot cell. No windows, so he couldn't see outside. Even when he exercised, there was a canvas around him when he was out walking. He has spent more time in isolation in a prison in the Western, Western uh, world than any other human being. It was that bad. His condition is that was that bad. And that's what really moved us to adopt him. How can a country treat a human being that way? Bununu moved to Israel as a child with his family from Morocco. He served in the Israeli army, studied philosophy, and found work at Dimona. This mysterious complex in the Negev desert employed thousands of people, all sworn to secrecy. For years, Israel called it a textile factory, never admitting its true purpose, making plutonium for bombs. Benunu's dissent over government policies was noted. He was given a warning and decided to leave. But not without the evidence which would change history. Today, his are still the only photographs ever seen of the inside of Israel's nuclear bomb factory. It's 16 years since Sunday Times journalist Peter Hounam heard rumors that an Israeli whistleblower was offering proof of what the world had long suspected. Here was someone who said he'd worked right inside the plutonium separation plant helping to fabricate atomic weapons who had taken photographs of the machinery and who had lots of information about how much material was being processed and so on and, uh, and therefore he was potentially going to be able to provide incontrovertible evidence that Israel had a very advanced program. Hounam flew to meet Benunu, who is now a Christian living in Australia. He was brought to England he was hidden in a country hotel and smuggled into the paper's offices in the boot of a car while they checked his story. But Israeli intelligence agents caught here on Wapping security cameras were onto him. They were waiting to strike. It took weeks for the Sunday Times to go to press with their scoop. When they finally did, on October the 5th, 1986, Benunu had vanished. He'd met an American woman in Leicester Square who seemed to like him. He was vulnerable and afraid. When she suggested he'd be safer with her in Rome, he fell for it. It was a classic honey trap. Once in Rome, the full weight of Israel's wrath kicked in. Benunu was overpowered, assaulted, and drugged. He'd been kidnapped and smuggled back to Israel by boat, unconscious. For weeks, no one knew where he was. Eventually, the Israelis brought Benunu to court for a secret trial. They now admitted they had him, but still no one knew how he'd got there. His kidnap, an illegal act on foreign soil, was kept secret. Somehow, Venunu found a pen and solved the mystery for the waiting press. Hijacked in Rome, 30th of September, 1986. It was Shimon Peres, then Prime Minister, who'd ordered Venunu's capture. To this day, the kidnap remains an official state secret. 
Perez was the father of Israel's secret nuclear program, and for him, the Nunu was a spy. He was a traitor of this country. So what was your reaction? Very negative. What did you do? What I thought should be done. Which was what? To put him to trial. Kidnap him. Uh, my lady, I can't go into all the processes. I'm unwilling. I don't see any reason to do so. The fact is that he was brought to trial. The Nunu's trial was held in secret. He was found guilty of treason and espionage and sentenced to 18 years in jail. The Nunu was treated uh, this way out of revenge out of a uh, way to deter others and because actually he's the person who broke uh, the taboo of the secrecy in the Israel society, a very strong and influencing taboo in a very closed society, more like a tribe. Mordecai Venunu started his sentence on the 27th of March, 1988. Few tears were shed. For most Israelis, he was more than a traitor. He'd rejected Judaism. His parents declared him dead, and the world forgot about Israel's nuclear whistleblower. But the truth was out. Vanunu told the world that Israel had developed between 100 and 200 atomic bombs and had gone on to develop neutron bombs and thermonuclear weapons, enough to destroy the entire Middle East, and nobody has done anything about it since. Today, proliferation experts report Israel has the world's sixth largest nuclear arsenal, with small tactical nuclear weapons, nuclear landmines, as well as medium-range nuclear missiles launchable from air, land, or sea. It's thought plutonium is made in Dimona. Nuclear weapons are assembled at Yodafat and stored at Zechariah and El Abun. Three nuclear submarines are based in Haifa, and Israel's biological and chemical warfare laboratories are at Nes Ziona. Israel never comments on such reports. But evidence continues to emerge. In 1992, an Israeli cargo plane crashed in Amsterdam, killing 43 people. The Israelis claimed it was carrying flowers and perfume. It took six years and a Dutch parliamentary inquiry before they admitted it was carrying DMNP, a key component for sarin nerve gas. The DMMP was bound for the Israeli Institute of Biological Research at Nes Ziona, one of Israel's most secret defense sites. It's subject to no international inspection, and reporting of its activities in Israel is prevented by strict military censorship. As war has loomed closer, small signs of dissent have appeared on the suburban streets of middle America. Nick and Mary Eloff have been peace campaigners since the Vietnam War and the draft. The definition of a conscientious objector is someone who sincerely objects to participation in all forms of war. There are two words that are extremely important in that definition, sincere and all. Fear that the draft may return has led a new generation.